For decades after humanity's first visits to the moon, it seemed we had left it behind. The Apollo missions ended. The Soviets stopped sending probes. The moon sat in silence, watching. But recently, rockets began launching again. Nations reignited old dreams. And in the shadows of this new space race, one nation quietly took the lead, China. But what exactly did they find on the far side of the moon that changed everything? And why is the world suddenly obsessed with going back? After the last Soviet sample return in 1976, the moon became old news. The spotlight shifted to Mars, Jupiter's moons, and deep space. For decades, Earth's closest neighbor was largely ignored. The reason? The Cold War was cooling down, space budgets were slashed, and there was no immediate return on investment. But beneath the surface of this seemingly dead rock, mysteries were buried, and resources that could change the world waited untouched. China's space ambition started slowly, but with a step-by-step -step strategy, the China National Space Administration, CNSA, launched a series of missions under the Chang'e program, named after the Chinese moon goddess. In 2007, were bided the moon, producing a 3D map and identifying soil composition. Its instruments found signs of something strange, helium-3, a rare isotope that could someday fuel nuclear fusion. By 2010, Chang'e-2 launched with better cameras and data-gathering tools, preparing for something bigger, a landing. In 2019, China made history. Chang'e-4 became the first spacecraft to land on the far side of the moon, a region never visited by any nation. It touched down in the von Karman crater, part of the massive South Pole Aitken Basin. But why does the far side matter? It's constantly shielded from Earth's radio signals, making it perfect for sensitive experiments in space telescopes. But landing there wasn't easy. Direct communication was impossible. So China launched a special relay satellite, Kuekiao, to hover beyond the moon and maintain a link. The Chang'e 4 mission wasn't just historic, it was mysterious. One of its biggest surprises was a strange, glossy substance found in a crater. Images released later showed a dark, dark, shiny patch, something like melted glass or volcanic material. Scientists eventually identified it as impact glass. Inside a sealed biosphere experiment, a cotton seed sprouted. This marked the first time any plant had grown on another planetary body. Though it died shortly after due to lunar night, the symbolic power was huge. Life on the moon was possible, even if just barely. And then, the mystery hut. A cube-like silhouette appeared in rover images. Was it a structure? A monolith? The internet lit up. Weeks later, the rover reached it. It was just a rock. But the viral excitement showed something bigger. The moon had captured the world's imagination again. While much of the media focused on discoveries, China's long-term motive is clear. Resources. Helium-3, rare on Earth but plentiful on the moon, could revolutionize energy production. Just a few ounces could power entire cities. Lunar mining could become the next gold rush. And control over these resources? That means power. That means dominance. There are military implications, too. Some fear the far side of the moon could house or communication jammers. Though Chang'e 4's payload was openly scientific, its military oversight has raised eyebrows. Could the moon become a new strategic high ground? China isn't alone. NASA has returned to lunar planning with the Artemis program, aiming to land astronauts again and build permanent bases. Private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are racing to build rockets, landers, and supply chains. Quiet competition is no longer quiet. China has announced plans to send astronauts by 2030, and both superpowers are targeting the moon's South Pole, a region rich in sunlight and water ice. The far side is now a front line, and in 2024, Chinese officials formally named the U.S. as their main competitor. The space race is back, but this time, it's not about flags, it's about footholds. The next steps are already underway. Chang'e 6 returns with the first samples from the far side. Chang'e 7 will explore the polar regions, searching for ice and testing equipment. Chang'e 8 will test 3D printing lunar buildings. And after that, a permanent robotic research base by the early 2030s China wants to partner with other countries, just not under the US-led Artemis Accords. Meanwhile, NASA continues its own efforts, with Artemis 3 expected to land humans sometime after 2026. Two powers, two paths, same destination. But while both China and the U.S. are setting their sights on the moon, 
They're doing it in very different ways. China's missions are deliberate and quietly ambitious, each one carefully building on the last. There's no rush, just a clear and steady climb towards something much bigger. Each spacecraft, each rover, each experiment is part of a long-term plan to establish a lasting presence on the moon. Meanwhile, the United States is taking a different route. NASA has returned to the moon with help from private companies and international partners. Rockets like SpaceX's are rewriting the rules of space travel, and government agencies are focused on laying the groundwork for something permanent. It's not just about planting flags anymore. It's about building something that lasts. What's emerging is not a single mission or even a single nation's goal, but a new kind of competition. This isn't the space race of the 1960s. This time, it's not about who gets there first. It's about who stays, who builds, and who controls the future of space exploration. It's about the infrastructure, the alliances, and the access. It's about who gets to write the rules for the next era of human expansion. And at the center of it all is one place, the moon. Not just as a destination, but as a stepping stone, a training ground, a launch pad for what comes next. Whether it's mining resources, testing survival systems, or preparing to go deeper into the solar system, the moon is the stage where it all begins. Already, talk of lunar bases, solar stations, and permanent settlements is becoming less science fiction and more real. Governments are drawing up blueprints, budgets are being approved, and missions are being scheduled years in advance. What was once a far-off dream is quickly becoming a question of when, not if. And yet, with every new mission, the stakes quietly grow. Because with each rover, each probe, each lander, we're not just exploring. We're dividing, planning, positioning, drawing invisible lines on a world that doesn't belong to anyone, yet. That's the quiet reality behind the renewed interest in the moon. It's not just about discovery, it's about destiny. So what did China really find on the far side of the moon? Perhaps nothing alien, but certainly something revolutionary. The confirmation of helium-3, the viability of biospheres, the untouched terrain rich in mystery and minerals, and most importantly, a blueprint for humanity's next step. Will this lead to collaboration or confrontation? Could we see rival bases compete Eating space laws and resource claims that echo earthly politics? Or will the moon become a shared outpost for all mankind? One thing is clear. The moon is no longer just a relic of the past. It's the launch pad for the future. And the far side is just the beginning.